Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. Welcome back for Live from the Heartland for the week of June 15th. And once again, we're recording it on the 10th. And this is one of my favorite times of the month when I get to bring on Tom Clark for his monthly uh, observation of what's going on local to global. And uh, for a, a younger guy than me, but still an older guy, he really gets around, does a lot of study, puts a lot of thought into it. So welcome to you, Tom. Well, good good day to you, Michael. Right on. Good oh, to have you. Marvelous audience. Uh, well, let's start right off with uh, some of the things that you mentioned you might want to talk about. And one would be a Carlos du Sable, a.k.a. Lakeshore Drive. What do you got? Well, there is an interesting piece people can look up in Block Club over the last week or so. Um, this is an idea that's been kicking around for a while. And, of course, we have one day a year when we can ride uh, Lakeshore Drive on bikes. And it's it's a wonderful Sunday when they do it. It's um it's very freeing to be going down um, an expressway that should really just be a parkway. Um, and anyway, there's, there are serious, people don't know the city has been undergoing for over a year now, a, a serious study and makeover of Lakeshore Drive. A lot of it's concentrated around the congestion point of Chicago Avenue uh, near Streeterville, um, which I think is one of the biggest sources of air pollution besides our major expressways like the Kennedy and the Dan Ryan. But um, the there's an opportunity to radically rechange and reclaim even more of our lakefront by taking that parkway, which has become an expressway, um, away from the lakefront and converting it to a true parkway that has trolleys and buses and bikes and people walking. And uh, we eliminate combustion engines from the lakefront. Uh, it's a radical idea, but I think it's the kind of thing we ought to be thinking of. It would be cheaper than rebuilding parts of Lakeshore Drive. And I think it would be a true tribute to De Sable for when we have renamed that road because he's the one who kind of started it all. So um, I, I think it's an interesting proposal that came out last week that people ought to look at because I think there are parts of it that actually could really happen before they put down one more uh, load of asphalt on our lakefront. Well, I do know they got a lot of new pavement up here on the north end. And I do remember when I did a triathlon, the kind of neat thrill of riding a bike on Lakeshore Drive. It, it's There's nothing, almost nothing else like it. What do you got on uh, the homeless issue in unhoused persons in Chicago? Well, just this week, there's a new report out by the city. Every year, usually in January, in the dead of winter, the city does an annual survey, and it's always been somewhat controversial because their numbers are always much lower than the Coalition for the Homeless or other uh, advocacy organizations that probably are a lot closer to the issue. But this year's survey was anticipated and finally came out six months later because we have what? Post-pandemic, two, uh, the so-called migrant crisis, and three, the overall uh, inflation in housing costs. And uh, it's a very tight market, and one should not be surprised to hear uh, with this city's report that the number of homeless have tripled since the last time the city uh, looked at this. The city's study has never looked at people who are doubling up or you know, moving in with mom and dad or moving in with a brother or sister when they you know fall on tough times. Uh, so those people who are unhoused never quite make it into the numbers. And I don't want to get into the numbers thing here, except even the city is saying, um, thank God we built those shelters for migrants. Otherwise, we'd have an even bigger problem. I think the city's making a mistake in blaming this upsurge on the migrants, because while there are increased tent cities, which may in fact be migrants, we also know of anecdotal examples of people who just can't find housing. And and it doesn't mean they're necessarily out in the street in a tent. They are doubling up or they're thinking of moving, even though there are jobs here, because housing has become uh, just incredibly expensive. Um, so I think the studies uh, 
worth looking at. It was a classic weekend city press release because there's no reaction for the Coalition for the Homeless or other advocacy groups. And I'll wait to see what they have to say in the coming days and weeks about this latest effort by the city to catalog how big the problem is. Uh, you know, we have a big election coming up in November. We also have an election coming up uh, for an elected school board here in Chicago. You know, we've been talking about an elected school board for a long time. It's true around the rest of the state, I think. Um, and uh, there are plans now to do it, and we're in the process. It won't be totally elected. The mayor gets to appoint some of it. But what's your take on it? Well, given that we're in a blue state and a lot of people think, oh, I don't have to bother working and voting for one of these old guys. It's, you know, Illinois. Um, I hear that from some family members. I tell them, oh, no, no, we got to. I say, no, it. there's a more important election. If you don't think the presidential election, which may determine the future of our democracy, is important, then let me tell you, there's a chance to actually affect local school policy by making sure we get the right candidates in those first round of elections. And having visited the Glen, uh, the Glenwood uh farm market this weekend, uh, the petitioners are out. And I think it's a really important election for people to pay attention to and to get the right uh, candidates uh, on the ballot. Well, we'll see how it goes. I know we had an endorsement session at the Network 49, so we have a candidate. And uh, I did see one of our members coming back from the farmer's market with a uh, Hold. She didn't have any room for me to sign the petition. So she had collected a lot of petitions. Thank you, Chris Johnson. Chris um, was working hard. Yep. No one could get by her without getting signing a petition. You know, at the outset of the show today, I did mention under the bad things, horrible things, uh, the, what happened uh, just most recently in Gaza, where um, unfortunately, I mean, I know some of the hostages were rescued, but the, the price was like 240 plus people killed, including 43 children to rescue four people. And uh, hopefully things will change there. But we had some activity here uh, and it seems to have abated a little bit. Uh, talk a little bit about the campus demonstrations around Gaza. Well, I find myself doing a bit of deja vu because many of those campus uh, demonstrations about the current war in Gaza uh, took place in the same weekend as the anniversary of Kent State and and the campus upheavals in, in the Vietnam era. So it was interesting to see how this whole thing developed. And not surprisingly, when summer break actually began, most of those campus uh, demonstrations dissipated. But I do think it's interesting. We still see people walking out of graduation ceremonies and other students who protested being denied graduation. Um, so this is not an issue that's gone away. I do think the current generation has learned maybe a little bit more about uh, nonviolent civil disobedience and some of the the consequences of, of uh, taking that kind of action. Um, I do think we'll have some more experience with it this summer in Chicago when a certain convention comes to town and we'll see how that all develops. But I think, you know, bottom line, uh, war doesn't solve anything. In my experience, in my lifetime, I have not seen a single skirmish, police action or outright war achieve its intended purpose. It's achieved at the negotiating table, which the current Israeli government leaders seem to be unwilling to do. Um, so we have uh, two people who need to be talking to each other who instead are bombing each other. And until they can figure out a way to sit down at the table together, I'm afraid we can, we'll have a continuing human tragedy in the Middle East. A totally disproportionate response. I appreciate the angst over the October 7th incursion, but uh, just about everything since has not solved the problem. It's complicated it more. And... Yeah. In a lot of go ahead. I just said I think that you know Israel keeps kind of shooting themselves in the foot. <clears throat> I mean, initial support around when when the, the attack came down, but since then, you know, whether it be the UN, the World Court, uh, European countries, everybody has really uh, been very critical of Israel and Israel's response. And Gantt just re resigned from the government, so that's going to mean in the next few days we're going to hear more about where that goes. Yeah, it's it's going to be hot headlines for a while, I'm afraid. Well, um, 
One of the things that uh, keeps coming up all the time with uh, the, around the demonstrations around Gaza and around support for Palestinian statehood and the Palestinian people is um, uh, people being labeled anti-Semitic. And there are certainly some people who are anti-Semitic and do things and call for things that are unwarranted or certainly not something we are for. But on the other hand, it's it's possible to be really critical of Israel and not be anti-Semitic. I've had tough conversations about this, and I've kind of resigned myself to having to do a lot of makeup calls when this is all over with, because there's um, a lot of ill will that's been spilled, and there's there's a real mental roadblock, in my experience, in being able to distinguish between the actions of uh, a secular government um, and the uh, desires of both the Israeli as well as Palestinian people in that region. I mean, we're talking about thousands of years of conflict over a little slice of land. Gaza itself is about the same size as Chicago in terms of population and square miles. So just think of what it would be like if we had constant bombing overhead as we move from one neighborhood to the next, trying to avoid the latest incursion. That's what's going on in Gaza right now. We're talking about a million people or a third of Chicago's population having moved to two or three different places just in the last six months. So it, it's a terrible situation. Until people start talking with each other, I don't see a resolution. You know, uh, on the news, uh, there was a representative from the Palestinian demonstrations that have been going on here in Chicago, you know, frequently and in great number, um, and talking about the Democratic Convention. And you previously mentioned the Democratic Convention. Uh, and, you know, you and I are veterans of uh, two earlier Democratic Conventions here in Chicago, uh, one of which in their first one in 68, I was photographed trying to tip over a paddy wagon, which led to the 33 interviews that I did in the, <laughs> during the next one. And all of a sudden, I'm getting these calls. I did uh, I did an interview with USA Today, and I got a call from uh, National Public Radio and have a, one coming up there. So I don't know. I'm developing my chops on what to say around it, and I'm not quite in the same place I was in 1968. What do you think about the Democratic Convention, and what would you like to see, and what do you expect to see? Well, I don't know who's advising the mayor, but I think there's a whole different tack, and it's not too late to consider this. I think uh, the city of Chicago should declare um, that the Democratic Convention is also going to be a celebration of the First Amendment, and we ought to be staging First Amendment parades downtown, around McCormick Place, and around the United Center with speaker stages and complete sound systems, and let people announce what their issues are and engage with the public to the extent they can, because that's what demonstrators have been looking for. I think the mayor should be welcoming the world to come to Chicago and demonstrate how much we support uh, a, a democratic way of doing things and support of the First Amendment. We may not like all the ideas expressed, but we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. Um, this idea of making sure the police are trained well enough in order to encounter whatever. I mean, we haven't seen the likes of Abby Hoffman or Jerry Rubin show up to try to organize people. Not that they were particularly good organizers. It was more of the John Roses and the Marilyn Katzes that I think actually organized what happened in Chicago back in 68. And I know what we did in 96 in order to uh, tell a different story about Chicago, which was to move beyond the convention center and the politicians and get real live community sources in front of the many reporters who were coming. Um, I don't know that there's that kind of an effort happening yet today, but I do think there's an opportunity to show off the good parts of Chicago, as well as to demonstrate freely about stuff that needs to be fixed. And so I, I think the city should be taking a different tack than they have, and they should be letting permits, uh, they, they, they should be passing them out. Um, because I think that's what we ought to be <laughs> celebrating in a contrast to what will be going on um, 90 minutes away in Milwaukee a month before then. I mean, consider it. The grand old party is going to nominate a convicted felon. Uh, it's just and He's no Eugene Debs. I and mean, we do have history of someone <laughs> running for president from jail. Yeah, it's we a do. a different dynamic than the current one that we're facing. 
So um, I, I, I think there's another whole way that we could be staging this convention and um, we'll, we'll see if, if the city comes around to that point of view. I, I love that idea of celebrating the First Amendment and uh, the right to free speech and having uh, parades. Um, I don't know. I haven't kept up with uh, the negotiations, but I know they were trying to have the, the you know, the demonstration stages many, 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 many blocks and even miles from the United Center and where things are going to be going on. So it should be right what... next to the United Center. Take over the Malcolm X College parking lot um, and. Fill it up with the people. Well, maybe you, uh, I don't know if our wonderful older woman, Maria Haddon, is going to be listening or viewing this show, but I think maybe you or I could catch her ear. And there you go. Too, so let's see. Let's round this out by really going local, Tom. We got a few minutes left of this first segment of Live from the Heartland for June 15th, the week of. And uh, we live in a wonderful neighborhood. We're very fortunate that we're a pretty blue neighborhood. And uh, there's a lot going on up here in Rogers Park. Why don't you share a couple of things you've observed and uh, would like to share? Well, the farmer's market is open again. And as my wife, Jean, and I discovered yesterday, one goes there for really good food, if not cheap, um, but really <laughs> high quality food. And it's local vendors, so I fortunately can afford to pay the prices and support local farmers and vendors. Uh, every year, there are one or two new vendors at Glenwood, and it's always fun to see which baker or which uh, craft maker might also show up. They also have a whole art thing going on now in uh, the Glenwood Bar uh, storefronts, which was interesting to see. Um, they've kind of done this before, but it was a bigger deal uh, yesterday. Anyway, I, I realized once again, one goes to the farmer's market, not just to support local farmers and get good food, because it's a social town hall sort of gathering. And that indeed happened yesterday. Petitions here, uh, the uh, Wild Onion Food Co-op opens this coming week, and there's a lot of excitement around that because they're still trying to get new owners to sign up and make this a real going concern. Um, the I think just our our lakefront every night uh, it's different and I it, it's just wonderful to see uh, regular neighbors showing up uh, sometimes like during the Northern Lights extravaganza a few weeks ago the beaches were crowded at night I love that kind of public activity and it's really um, uh, it's really beefing up do you know yet what's going in the old cabana stand. I don't know, but there is a woman going to take over the stand. We used to, when the Heartland Cafe was still around, we had a a little extension down there at the lake called Heartland Stand in the Sand. I loved it. I'd go to the beach early in the morning. I'd go inside, unlock the flip up doors, start the coffee. I'd jump in the lake, hang out, come back, drink my coffee. And uh, it was great. And I do miss doing that. However, the guy who had it last year and is not doing it this year did a pretty wonderful job. And all of a sudden, when I go by there, there's like a, like a tarp, a thing up above now. I forget what you call them. It, the place is painted up. And I think there is a, a woman is going to be running it. We'll fill people in on that. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about, because you and I have a friend who just got himself a two battery uh, bicycle how you know that is electric powered um richard perlman he came by my uh my little uh, gallery out in front here yesterday on sunday and he talked about how this thing will go 35 miles an hour and i go and no you don't have to have any registration you don't need a license to drive it and uh, then you and i were talking earlier about how many people are on scooters or on bikes and they're in and out of traffic and they're not following the rules what's your take on bikes Motorized bikes, scooters. Uh, well, having reached a certain age, I too am looking at a tricycle and uh -huh. a, a motorized one. Um, uh, I, I, I I'm not sure we're going to have the extra pennies uh, quite yet to do it because they're not cheap. But I, bet. Uh, I miss riding my bike. I haven't been on a bike for about five or six years now, and it's because I'm nervous. I have good balance, but I have two shoulders that can't take another fall. So I, I've I've just stayed off the two wheeler, and uh, but I miss it, and I think that what will need to come is more bike lanes 
and the other work that they've been doing to make our streets more pedestrian safe with bus bump outs and stuff like that. Um, we have cars in the middle of the city that just go too fast on side streets, and we need to figure out a way to slow down that traffic and make more room for people who are walking and for people who are on bikes. I appreciate that some drivers have had bad experiences with some bicyclists, but just about every bicyclist I know has had bad experiences with drivers. So I think we need to come to some uh, meeting of the minds, but part of it is the infrastructure. The city was uh, built up off of horse and carriages, went to cars, and just as we talked at the beginning of the show, there are certain roads like Lakeshore Drive that have become expressways and that we maybe should get rid of and go back to a, a more sedate lakefront atmosphere where we have bike lanes and trolley lanes and stuff like that, but not cars going 60 miles an hour. Or faster, weaving in and out of traffic. Yes. Well, Tom, it's always good talking to you, whether it's in person or here via Zoom on Live from the Heartland. You are an executive uh, producer or a producer or emeritus, whatever you want to be. And I know you, uh, you're you probably in the wings when we need you. We'll be out of town, although Zoom lets us go anywhere. And I'll be seeing you in the neighborhood and probably in the next few days. So you have a wonderful day, and thank you very much. Take care, Michael.